Welcome my friend Seminger here. Thank you for joining me for this episode. Today I'm going to give you an update just in general on everything going on in my personal life with status of the cargo trailer back here and my truck. So there's just a lot of little details that I figured I'd fill you in as subscribers, friends and family so that you sort of know what's going on. Let's roll the intro and get into it. This video is sponsored by Renowned Cargo Trailers. In the last episode, I was having a solar crisis, as I called it, going on with my trailer and uh, wasn't sure what was going on. It's about a week, week and a half later, and I have a clearer picture. And although I don't know for sure what was happening, I have some pretty good ideas by just working through things over the last uh, several days as well as talking to my friend Scott down in San Diego who helped me design this electrical system, the solar setup here, and troubleshooting, doing a bunch of measurements. So let me explain what's going on. Oh, but before I explain sort of what's going on, let me show you something really fascinating and interesting. Some of you have commented on why do I have three charge controllers on my solar setup instead of one, which would be much easier to maintain. Well, today I can give you sort of a specific example, and I should say this is very, very rare situation. I would say 99% of the time I'm parked in full sunlight, all the panels are getting full sun, and it's not an issue. But today is a little bit interesting. Let me show you what's going on. Notice here, looking at the side of the cargo trailer that I have shadow here, and uh, I'm gonna back up and show you so you can see the panels on top, what's happening there. Not sure if you could see with this particular lens off in the distance, but I have six panels over here off in the distance, and four of these panels are pretty much in the shade of the tree to the left of the cargo trailer, and the rear two panels are in full sunlight right now. So this presents a very interesting situation. And inside we can go look at the charge controllers and see what's going on. And before I show you the charge controllers, let me say this is a rare situation where you're parked where one tree or maybe two trees are shading part of the panels, but some of the panels are in full sunlight. But this is a great example of where three charge controllers can be to an advantage. By the way, the cost of three versus one, maybe 10% more. And so I thought it had a couple of advantages, so that's the route I went with. Let's go inside. I'm inside now. Last time I told you that I hooked up two additional panels to give me all six running. Let me show you what's going on with the charge controllers. All right, here you can see the left one, center one, and this is for the rear panels. Notice the rear panels are pulling in 20.7 amps of power. Um, that is probably just on those two rear panels. Uh, close to 600 watts or something like that, 550 watts just off of those two panels. Notice these others, 3.5 and 2.5. Those are in the shade, which is why those are lower numbers. So here you can see the advantage of having separate charge controllers and breaking up your panels so that the power is a little bit different. If I had all these six panels going into one charge controller, then they would all be rated at this lowest setting, which is 2.5 here. Everything would be 2.5, and I would only be getting probably about 200 watts. So in summary, by having separate charge controllers and breaking up the panels, if one set of panels, one set of two, are in the shade or partial shade or frisbee lands on the panels, then the other panels, which are in full sunlight, will bring in full power. So that's one advantage. The other is if you need to do work on panels or you need to uh, return a charge controller, it goes out or something like that, you still have two that are running. Think of it sort of like having three engines versus one. You can still run on two. So it's sort of a redundant system and I think it's worth the extra cost to do that. Uh, there are some downsides to this. It's a little bit more complex and so that's another thing totally. One of my favorite things to do is to sit back here on my rear deck uh, and rear deck versus being on the ground not a whole bunch of difference except for one fact I like to walk barefoot and so inside my trailer I'm barefoot all the time or in my socks without shoes I take them off before I enter and I think that's a habit I picked up when I lived and traveled over in Asia for a long time. 
it just became something that I really enjoy. So having the deck here, I can step outside still barefoot and not be picking up all of the pine needles and dirt and uh, just the sand and everything else. And I can be in a clean space here and just sit and drink my coffee or have my breakfast or just sit here and meditate in wildlife in the forest as you can see around me. Anyway, uh, let me give you an update. Uh, personally, the thing that I think I haven't really followed up on is my shoulder. About three and a half months ago or something like that, I tore my rotator cuff in my right shoulder here. Since that time, I tried going to urgent care several times and each time there was a huge weight or another problem like their x-ray technician was out or the other urgent care I went to didn't have an x-ray technician because I really want to get an x-ray and look in there and see if any bone fragments are you know jammed in a weird place or if there's other things torn ligaments uh, something weird going on so in the meantime I've been doing lots of exercises based on YouTube videos and advice from some friends that are knowledgeable in the medical community and people that have gone through physical therapy. So I have about 97 percent motion in this arm now. I can lift it pretty much as high. This is my left arm here. I can go all the way up. That's very easy. Here I can go almost all the way up and it's just sort of tight and it's not really painful it's just uncomfortable and so what I do is every day probably four five six times a day anytime I'm standing up walking around going for walks I'm doing uh, all sorts of motions and exercises uh, light weights off to the side to the front and strengthening all this area in the shoulder so it's coming along really, really well. I am interested in the near future in trying to find an urgent care that does have x-ray and go ahead and take that extra step just to make sure and just to know a little bit more what's going on. But I think pretty much that's taken care of. Everything is good there. Let's talk about the solar crisis situation, what was going on there, or what we think was going on there. I had parked mostly in trees for about a week. I had just sort of indirect sunlight, and each day I was losing about 5% power. And I made several mistakes. One is going by the percentage ratings on the Renergy charge controllers as well as my Victron probably not a good idea according to Scott my sort of mentor for all things electric uh, he said it's much better to go off of voltage amperage and multiplying those together to look at watts um, and looking at a bunch of other measurements so probably I was actually lower than I thought and when I was pretty low um, Again, I'm going to use percentages here, like 55% going to sleep. So my batteries are about half of their status and maybe even lower than that, maybe down to a third of their charge. And I have lithium batteries, so I can go all the way down to zero um, if need be. But anyway, so I went to sleep in that situation and I turned off my big inverter, which is a 3000 watt inverter. Uh, to save power. Uh, that turns off power to my induction cooktop, a uh, bunch of other components, which I don't really need at night. I have a second inverter, which is a Victron. It's a 1200 watt inverter, and that's dedicated just to the fridge. Um, for the last year or so, I've left it completely on. It has two modes. It has a full-on, full-time power conversion from 24 to 110. Um, and it has a second mode, and this is the key factor. The second mode is an eco mode. When you change it to eco mode, it wakes up when it needs power. Let's say you had a light switch and you're turning on the light. It would sense that need for the power and it would wake up and it would send through the power. And when you turn off the light, then it goes back to sleep and it just has a trickle, just enough to sense when a, a switch is flipped. Well, I have a special fridge that is analog instead of digital. There's no digital displays inside, just dial knobs, and it has a mercury switch to turn on the compressor. But my particular model to get that has what's called a hard start compressor. 
So the compressor that freezes things and refrigerates things draws a lot of power when it starts up. Uh, not a big deal. My Victron's pretty strong. It can handle that just fine. So it ramps up. It draws a lot of power when it ramps up and then it lowers down and then when it goes off then if I have it in eco mode then it just goes to sleep so it's really good for power usage but apparently when you are low on voltage and it's in eco mode which I had it in sometimes the fridge will not start and I was pretty groggy I didn't remember this when I shot my last video but now I recall getting up at about 3 o'clock, something like that, some ungodly crazy hour, and list being woke up by my fridge trying to start, the compressor trying to start and failing, and the inverter uh, trying to wake up and failing. So both of those are tremendous power draws from the battery bank when it's trying to do this hard start. So let's say it draws 150 or 200 watts just to try to do a hard start. And if it's unsuccessful, eight to 10 seconds later, it tries again. And eight to 10 seconds later, it tries again. Imagine if it's doing this for three or four hours every 10 seconds trying to start up while I'm sleeping and not noticing this. If I were awake, not a big deal. So I think maybe my batteries were at one-third capacity, something like that, pretty low. And that for hour after hour after hour, my compressor in my 110-volt fridge was trying to start up and failing because of the eco mode and not quite waking up. So that's the scenario. Some, some people are going to say, well, why don't you get a 12-volt fridge? You can use this model, that model. I had a 12-volt fridge. I understand what they're like. I didn't like the top load um, uh, method of putting food in there. It was just a lower quality of life for me. I wanted an upright fridge, which I have now. Let me show you my fridge. Here's my fridge. I have a freezer up on top. And then down below, I have the refrigerator portion. I love having a traditional fridge top and bottom like this um, and it's just really really nice to have this extra space and have an actual freezer full time and not have it be top loaded. So on my diesel heater I have a separate video that I'm going to be releasing soon with the install. It's pretty much done ready to go in I'm just waiting for one part should be arriving tomorrow and then I'll be able to do my test and set up and then uh, upload that video for you but uh, things are at the tail end of getting that actually running after oh, several weeks that I've been working on this let's talk about my truck those of you who have been following me for a while know that I bought this 2001 Ford F350 oh probably May of last year and it's been a fantastic truck for me. Uh, I use it to tow my trailer. It's very robust. It runs absolutely fantastic. I love this truck. Uh, just a couple of weeks after I purchased it out in Las Vegas, I drove to Denver, Colorado, and it was stolen. I'll link the episode above. That was a very traumatic experience for me. And uh, I got it back. It was recovered by the police a few weeks later. Minus the interior seats, the carpet um, the, and a bunch of plastic molding, the stereo, and let's see, the batteries and the tailgate. I think that's pretty much it. Anyway, you can review those episodes if you're interested in seeing what happened there. So over the past several months, I've been working to replace components in there. I now have a carpet kit. I bought some uh, replacement seats, very nice, off of eBay. And so I've been doing various upgrades. It is running fantastic mechanically, the engine, transmission, everything. It tows the trailer really, really well. I'm still struggling to get a few little trim parts, pieces and parts for it, as well as a carpet kit to go inside. Well, I have a carpet in it, but I didn't do a very good job of installing it, so probably we'll have to rip that out and get a professional installer to put it in. Or I've got to figure out from somebody who knows more about carpet how to get the carpet that I have in it to lay flat. But anyway, uh, it's functional, it's great, it's very comfortable to drive, 
and uh, I love this truck so that's pretty much the status on the truck. So that's all that's happening with me. Um, I'm just making progress in building out my trailer here and enjoying life in uh, Arizona up here in the forest. I'm headed uh, this summer to Colorado and uh, that's about it. Thank you so much for watching. Savor the moment and I'll see you in a future episode.